This is a brick building in Salt Lake City, Utah, and that is a tiny red door. And behind that red door is the greatest collection of Land Cruisers, well, in the entire world. And if you think I'm kidding, come check it out. The Toyota Land Cruiser has such a long history, it can be kind of confusing deciphering different models. But here's what you need to know. Land Cruisers are differentiated by their series number, and the lower the number, the older the vehicle. Now let's quickly talk about the models that were sold brand new here in the United States. There's all sorts of funny numbers and letters that you'll see on these placards, but bear with me, it's actually quite simple. This is a 40 series Land Cruiser, an FJ40, and it's kind of the first one you think of when you think of an old Land Cruiser sold in the US. This is an FJ55, same era as the 40, but much bigger, four doors, and now it's ready to take on your family. This is an FJ60, and it's bigger than the 55, more refined than the 55, and much better suited for US highways. This is the 80 series Land Cruiser, and it's really the first model where luxury started becoming involved, but still had solid axles. These are 100 series Land Cruisers, so it's the first Land Cruiser that has independent front suspension. It's also finally super squishy, super soft, and super expensive. This is the current Land Cruiser called a 200 series. This right here is the very first Land Cruiser sold in the US. No, not the first model, the very first one ever sold in the US. But in this video, we're not talking about the ones you may have seen on the road. We're talking about the forbidden fruit. All right, so we've covered the Land Cruisers you've probably seen on US soil but now let's cover some of the incredible models that never made it here. Starting with this, this is called a 70s series Land Cruiser. This one's a 2015, even though it looks like something straight out of 1985. Let me have Kurt Williams explain our resident Land Cruiser expert because he's way smarter and way more articulate than I'll ever be. Okay, these are really neat. This is a GRJ 76, and its brother over here, the white one, is a GRJ 79. These are 30th anniversary. But that's not 30th anniversary of the Land Cruiser, that's 30th anniversary of the 70 series. So they came out in 1985, this is a 2015. So they re-released them in Japan market only as a 30th anniversary uh, special edition. These have factory locking front and rear differentials, factory winch, and the neat thing about these is they run the 4.0 gas motor that we saw in the US, the same 4.0 that the Tacoma 4Runner and FJ Cruiser had. Gotta think about all my 4.0 platforms, <laughs> some other applications too, but yeah, same gas motor, manual transmissions, uh, just a really neat truck. So they're only available for one year. These two are here on special import exemption. They can't be driven. They're here because it is a museum and they have six and seven miles on them respectively. So but uh, it is a manual transmission drivetrain. It's still a solid axle, coil suspension. It's leaf sprung in the rear, so it still has that stalwart Land Cruiser chassis, the heavy duty chassis, and the solid front end. So not much shared with US platforms at this point, but it, it does share across the 70 series platforms globally. These are really cool. This is a 2015 model truck, but this part's still in use today. This is the factory Toyota electric winch controller and it's the same controller for a lot of years and if you look at it it's just this neat utilitarian winch controller that looks like it's straight out of like 1989 they is used that, the same that? one in yeah in the in the early 90s yeah it so, was it definitely is the same uh, controller but you know what it works and it's it's a robust controller and this neat part of this truck is the factory electric winch so does it drive like an 80s vehicle do it would be, it would drive a lot, it would have the motor of a newer 4Runner, that, mo that sm uh, smooth, crisp power that the 4L has that everybody's come to love, but a solid axle and the rear leaf spring, so it does drive like a little bit of an older technology truck, but that's what they want in the markets that that's appropriate for is uh, payload capacity. They're less worried about ride quality, less worried about sound, more worried about you know longevity of the chassis and those conditions that will be running them in. So where can you still buy this truck, first of all? So the 30th anniversary, this per, these particular trim models would only were only available in Japan as the 30th anniversary, but 70 series holistically are available all over uh, South and Central American countries, uh, all over Africa, Russia gets some of them, Australia is obviously a giant market for them. So quite a few markets still get the 70 series to this day. Now this is not a standard 70 series Land Cruiser, this has got some special stuff added to it. Very special. So this is a VDJ78, meaning it's got the one VD, FTV single turbo V8 
uh, diesel, which is amazing motor. It's a, it really works. It works really well. This particular truck is quite modified, as you can see, and that was purpose built. Uh, Greg Miller started Expedition 7 along with Scott Brady, who's here with us tonight, and took these trucks, and this truck in particular has been on all seven continents. Do you know how long it took? It was about three years, because it wasn't non-stop. It was go do a continent, then you had to wait to ship them, do another continent, and bounce around. Now hold up, Kurt. This looks just like our Land Cruiser. This looks like something you can buy in the States. Why is this on our list? Yeah, it's a, it's, it does look a lot the same. You'll notice it's right-hand drive. Okay. which tells us automatically it came from somewhere else. And this particular model came from Australia. And this is a VDJ200. This has the one VD FTV, similar to the 70 series, but a twin turbo diesel. So this is a factory V8 twin turbo diesel. This particular truck's got some exhaust, tune work, and chip work done to it, so it scoots. It moves, gets up and goes. Can I ask how much something like this would cost if you wanted to buy a new one in Australia? I think they're somewhere in the 100 to 120,000 range for a V8 twin turbo diesel model. Now this, this one's a fully, you know, got everything packaged, it's fully loaded, and then it's obviously been built too. This truck saw a lot of use in the Outback for the HEMA mapping company, and then they brought that to the United States and did some mapping with it as well. So it was driven here? It was driven here in the United States, yeah. How is that legal? Can you explain that? Yeah, absolutely. So even if a vehicle is less than 25 years old, it can come on a one-year temporary import to the United States. So it can legally be here and drive for one year before it needs to be exported. And because this truck was new, too new to import long term, 25 years or newer, it became a museum piece. We did some little side by side, just stop, light and go between my US spec 200 and this one. And you know, amazingly that the three UR is no slouch of a motor, the, the five, seven rocks. Okay. And it would actually just about pull away from this one. I think the big key of the turbo diesel is just the fuel economy is really where this shines. Factory dual tank, so it's got a factory sub tank. So it's really built for long distance travel versus the US one. Uh, has a little smaller gas tank and, and a thirstier motor. Uh, I love my 3UR, my, my URJ200, but if I could have the VDJ, I'd be all over it. Yeah, yeah. Really? So let's pop it up hood and take a peek at it. Are they also, are they as reliable? Are they pretty? They are, they've proven to be a, a very reliable oh, diesel. wow, that's super different. Yeah, top mount intercooler, and it is a, a twin turbo if you, they're buried in there, but I promise you there's two of them. Now, Kurt, I'm pretty sure we got this truck in the US. What is this? Kind of. We got a truck that is very similar. We did get the FJ40 in the United States that would share the whole front end. Where this one is unique is it's a BJ44. That B signifies it's got a diesel. We never did get diesel models of the 40 series. But that four on the tail end is something big too, and that means it's a little bit longer wheelbase. And if you were to compare this truck to a 40 series behind us, you'll note that this one is longer. So it grew both behind the door and behind the wheel well. So it's a really cool platform to have that longer wheelbase, maybe a little more practical uh, outside the US where they were using those long bench seats in the back as a, as a true troop carrier, loading a bunch of people in the back. So is this a military vehicle? Or is no, this, this a is a civilian version. This, this particular truck is a Japanese spec from the JDM market and it has about 11,500 <laughs> original miles. So is that, original that is, paint? that's original paint. So this truck is unrestored as you see it. So that's a good example of one that it would be naive to ever take that anywhere because it's so rare, you're not gonna find another 12,000 mile truck uh, that's never been touched and still has plastic on the visors. The door cards still have plastic on the door cards. It was never dealer prepped or never, the plastic was never taken off by whoever owned it. This is an HJ60, so you're right. It is very similar to the 60 series we had in the US. Big changes though, you see it's right hand drive, a pretty quick telltale sign that it's not from the US, but then the high roof. And this is, a, this is also a Japanese spec vehicle. One really neat thing about this, low miles, 23,000 kilometers, so convert that over, that's pretty low miles. And also, check out the plastic on the seats and the door cards. So when this vehicle was sold new, whoever owned it had the seats wrapped in like a custom seat cover as well as the door card. So it's never had anybody really sitting on any of the upholstery. So it's one of the most pristine samples of factory 60 series upholstery I've ever seen. Wow. And it does have a, an inline six uh, diesel motor. It's non-turbo in this application, a turbo one here behind us. So they were available both ways. Uh, but yeah, just a really neat truck. You could get factory cable locking differentials. Now, a lot of Land Cruiser owners in the US are familiar with the turn dial. We all look for that turn dial on an 80 series or an early 100. But the 60 series and the 70 series were available with cable lockers. So it's actually a pull lever either under the dash or next to the console, and it ran a full physical cable to the, lo to the differential that locked that locker engaged or not. And then you still had an indicator on the dash letting you know that it was locked. So really cool trucks. So what's the purpose of the high roof? 
A little bit more room, yeah. So some of these actually even had a third row in the back. This particular model doesn't, but yeah, some markets got a high roof just for a little more room and, and potentially if they were hauling more people and made it a higher passenger vehicle, which we never did in the US, they were always a two row. And now for the craziest Toyota in the entire museum. I promise you, I promise you, this is not a Humvee. This is called, ready for it? The Toyota Mega Cruiser. I cannot make this stuff up. And it is one of the most incredible off-roaders that you have never heard of. I mean, there's, there's no way these are Toyotas. What is this? Everybody says that when they see these. They immediately think to this one and think of a U.S. military vehicle. But these are, in fact, Toyotas. They were built by Toyota primarily for military use. So this is called a Mega Cruiser. So it's not really a Land Cruiser. It's a Mega Cruiser. But it fits into the Cruiser theme. And it does share some components with the Land Cruisers. But few of the really neat features of the Mega Cruiser, four-wheel steering. Portal reduction hubs, so they've got a lot of ground clearance and factory front and rear locking differentials. So you've got a four cylinder turbo diesel pushing around factory 37s with four wheel steering, front and rear lockers, pretty neat rig. So the question is, what was this for? Is this a military vehicle? Is this a civilian? They were, yeah. So this would be like a light mobility vehicle for the Japanese military. So these were used and are used to this day as a Japanese military vehicle. This is a troop carrier configuration. They did have pickup truck configurations that would have uh, you know, been utilizing different uh, means. They do tow trailers. This is like an, a light ammunition trailer that's behind this model. So yeah, variety of uses. This is their uh, light mobility vehicle for the Japanese military. Did this go anywhere else other than the Japanese army? No, there was one ever exported officially by Toyota. Okay. Other than that, uh, they were all used for military. Now there were, there may have been partner nations that did use those as well. Uh, there's photos of mega cruisers on a US hovercraft, for example. They've done some joint training and they're all right-hand drive. So there may be some play there of countries that they needed right-hand drive vehicles in. Now the civilian version is far more rare than the military. They made thousands and thousands of the military, but this civilian version, they made under 200 of them. So really limited number. And if you look inside, they really took the military truck, added a cab and a hard top on it, added an air conditioning unit. The military one doesn't have that. And that's about it. It's pretty Spartan inside there. Can you still buy this vehicle though? I mean, you mentioned they're still in use. Can you go out and buy in Japan a mega cruiser? They're available. They're getting to the age, particularly the civilian versions. Now, the military ones are getting of the age that they're legal to import to the United States. They have to be 25 years or old. So there are some that are 25 years old. The civilian versions are at or near that. They are very rare, but yes, the answer is you can find them, but when they made less than 200 ever, uh, you can imagine that the price is respective of that. Have you driven one? I have, I've driven both of these quite a bit. Okay, four cylinder turbo diesel. Moves around just fine. It's a, it's a large displacement four cylinder turbo diesel. They, they move 37s just fine. Wow, amazing. Yeah. I mean, it tops out about 65. It wasn't made for highway travel. It's made for convoy travel, but getting between zero and 65, they get up and boogie and they, they hold the highway. You can pass, you know, 70, 75 to get around somebody, but you're kind of wringing its neck a little bit, those high speeds, but that's not what it was designed for. Uh, it's off-road prowess, it's ability to carry a lot of cargo weight. Uh, the military version, for example, has CTIS on the rear tires. You can inflate and deflate the tires while you're driving. One for traction and off-road situations, but also for weight in the back to be able to inflate and deflate the tires. Amazing. So Perfect. cool stuff. Yeah, it's great. We could seriously spend hours in the Land Cruiser Museum here talking about everything related to these old trucks, but I'm just gonna let you do it yourself. So be sure to check out the Land Cruiser Heritage Museum here in Salt Lake City for everything that you'd possibly want to know about these classic Toyotas. As always, this is Tommy with the Fastlink Truck. Head over to tfltruck.com for more news, views, and real world Land Cruiser reviews because a little secret tomorrow, I'm gonna be driving some of these old beasts and hopefully not crashing them.